really, to tell you the truth, it just was surreal. It really was surreal. You thought of her as being indestructible, uh, a kind of person who's always going to be there. And Andrea is one of the people, you know, she could talk to bankers, but she could go out and talk to anybody in the community. She made things move. Always supportive. Um, it didn't matter what I tried to do. I could always count on Andrea Harris. There's only one Andrea Harris, and the way that that happened, the way I found out, and believe me, as I told people that day, people we kept saying, are you serious? Has it been confirmed? Nobody could believe it. Looking at Miss Harris and her statue, she was a small person, but she carried an electrifying voice. So let me say good morning, particularly since I'm starting on My People's Time. She has a very distinct, raspy kind of voice where um, it's definitely a void not hearing it. We sit around talking about all the negatives and we don't celebrate what's good and what's positive. And we got so much good. You know, what's wrong is, you know, what people really, somebody said one time that if you fail, and, uh, what's good is when you fail and fail and try again. What's wrong is when you fail and fail to try. Even if you did not know Miss Harris, you knew of Miss Harris. Um, and people always tell stories about, you know, she made me do this. And it wasn't an ask. It was like you were voluntold to do things. And she demanded that respect just because she was so compassionate about individuals and their success and so passionate about what she did. I was teaching a class uh, for Soul City and I got learned about getting around Warren County. And so I heard about this young dynamic person who was running a community organization and that's when I first heard about her. But I got to know her when uh, she and Lou Myers and Abdul were thinking about putting together an organization an organization that she called a think tank. When I first met her, I was just shocked. I said, dang on, I didn't expect to find Andrea Harris in Warren County. I mean, I just did not expect it. Now, that was just my expectation coming from the North, being in the country for the first time. But um, so we just got to know each other and I thought, dang on, I need to get her to come to work here. I was a day late in asking her to come to work at Seoul City. But that worked out well because she was running the Community Action Agency, uh, Franklin Vance Warren Opportunity, Inc. Uh, that covered Franklin Vance Warren counties. They were doing Head Start, summer feeding programs, uh, some stuff with adults. So Andrea was running that and she was just very interested in, even then we were talking about black economic development and she was just interested in it. And so, you know, that's when we started to work together a bit because there were some problems with funding at HUD. They were able to give some money to the community action agency that could come to us at Seoul City. So, but Andrea and I were like brothers and sisters. I mean, we fought, we argued, but we were always covered each other's back. Andrea and I went to kindergarten together, okay? Elementary school, high school. She was a regular sister, always in the neighborhood. She was one of the girls. She was one of the, you know, one of the folks uh, growing and one of the popular people in high school, not because she was a middle class person, because she was a real person. And she was from the very onset, like a second mom, you know. She and my grandmother both, they are super opinionated. So there is, you know, there's their opinion and there's their opinion. <laughs> then when two is wrong, see rule number one. <laughs> she was a big sister. She was a cheerleader extraordinaire. 
She was a mentor. She was an accountability partner. Whatever you needed her to be, she was that and she did it well. She cared not just intellectually, but in her soul about black people, about other marginalized people, and about women. There was no such thing as a women-owned business. Um, nobody considered it. And then um, when I had an opening in 81, I guess I had my first opening. That's when I hired Andre. I called Andre. I said, Andre, I need you to come work for me. And you know, a number of people were, oh, Lou, why, why, why'd you get her? What does she know about business? And I said, look, I said, this is not about business. I said, what we're doing, you know, this is a struggle. I mean, you ask somebody to give up something that is theirs, that's a struggle. I said, and there are going to be fights, and Andrea has more balls than most men that I know. She's not going to run away, and that's what's needed, somebody that can you know, stand in there, take the hit, and keep on going. I just considered her to be uh, one of the smartest uh, persons that I had ever met. She knew something about everything. She understood things at a national level. She understood things at a very small level, municipality, regardless, especially if it had to do with black people. She understood good governance, what it took the kind of people, the kind of structure, leadership. She understood all those things. And then she's the reason I'm the chair of the board. She came along when Republican was in control. And they probably looked at Ms. Harris like, who is this little African-American petite woman here telling us what we should do? She was the largest small woman I have ever met both in spirit and energy and everything else. She just kept on going. She just never stopped. She would be, Andrea would be at, at Bennett meetings. I'd go to meetings in Charlotte, she was there. I'd go to meetings in South Carolina, she was there. I'd go to meetings in Eastern North Carolina. She's in the middle of that. And just all in Raleigh, all the time in Raleigh. She was always doing something but she stayed on it. Not only did she stay on it, she stayed on all of us who she felt could help her and could and ought to be about the business of lifting up our people. She had a deep concern for humanity, uh, for uh, there were some, 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 some areas of interest that she had, uh, minority business, uh, just, just, just helping her people, as she called them, her people. In all the years I, 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 I've known, had a relationship with Ms. Harris, now one time she said, what's in it for me? Or oh, smudge, I'm looking for something in it for me. It was always about African-American, African-American got to do better. African-Americans need a share of the wealth. We need access to capital. I remember Ms. Harris calling me when there was a, it was a, a initiative, I can't think of the name right there. Abdul was the CEO of it was called the initiative, but it was a CDC that they believe in going in communities and to, uh, then it was affordable, affordable housing. Ms. Harris called me on the phone, she said, Smudgy, Abdul Rashid, now it's coming back to him, is gonna call you. The initiative is trying to do some affordable housing in the city of Charlotte. I need you to take care of them. Ebony Alexander called me first, she was part of the initiative. Um, Abdul called me second, I told Abdul, you good. He said, what? Miss Harrison, call me. I got my marching orders. Hey, I ain't, hey, ain't going to get on the wrong side of Miss Harris. She told me, take care of you when you come to Charlotte. I mean, and so it was always about African-Americans and not about this, this powerful young lady who maybe be, was 5'1". It never was about her, Steve. It, it never was. This uh, hero of all of ours, uh, none of this was about her. Um, it never, I never can say, and I, I like you say, been walking with her for, or behind her, for quite the uh, majority of my life. Um, I never saw it be about her or her ego. 
This was Andrea seriously concerned about people, justice, and equal opportunity for everybody. She loved her people, but she wanted justice to be justice. She had so much influence in the community. I mean, my grandmother would always say, Andrea, don't answer the phone. Just stop answering the phone. And when she would say, Mama, these people need me. What do you mean? There is no, who else, if I don't do it, who else is gonna do it? And she, grandma would say, I don't know, somebody other than you. Because the phone would ring all hours of the night, all day, all the time, with people just in the community who would call and say, you know, she would get up in the morning and say, well, this happened with that person or this person overnight, and now we gotta go. And I'm like, who is going and where are you going? You know, but she had her connections and her people. I gotta go talk to the mayor or the city council, or they're planning on putting the sewage lines over here again in our neighborhoods. You know, she was always very passionate about um, just our community and making sure that we were on the winning end and that things were not continuing to be the status quo, which was a real problem. And it's still a real problem in North Carolina. Andre was a product of an HBCU. And so she believed that HBCUs provided a different kind of education uh, for black students. She thought that in addition to the education that they provided, they also provided a commitment uh, to do something about social problems. And so she believed that and she was really disappointed in terms of how the communities viewed HBCUs. Uh, her notion was that, look, uh, these HBCUs have jobs. Uh, they provide all kind of economic uh, benefits for the community. And she was wondering, and so what she decided to do was to do the economic impact studies. Uh, see, Andrea uh, came along with the behavioral revolution. Uh, she believed that you have, had to have data and so she wanted to go out and do an economic analysis of HBCUs on their communities, and therefore communities would have to respond to them differently. I mean, many HBCUs, you read the newspaper, you read about the major institutions, but you did not read about HBCUs. She didn't like that. She thought that was wrong, and she worked hard uh, to change that, and because she could show the economic impact of these institutions, I think some of that got better. She was very passionate about uh, our HBCUs, very passionate about our HBCUs, and the importance of those HBCUs remaining committed to their original missions. Uh, because she recognized that that work was not complete. There are many, many African-Americans, persons of color, that still need the benefit of our institutions. Andrea was a, a very devoted uh, alum of Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina. She loved her school. And uh, I loved her school too, which became my school, uh, as I, once I left the institution, uh, they did award me an honorary doctorate. I went to Bennett College, which has its own story as to why I did, in 2000. I can't remember which particular day, but I can tell you I wasn't long on Bennett College's campus before I met Andrea Harris. She is legendary. That is not hyperbole, that is an accurate statement. She's legendary at Bennett. When you talk about Bennett alumni, you will not begin the list for many minutes before you'll have to say Andrea Harris. I think that Many HBCUs, like many African-Americans and Blacks, don't recognize the value 
that we have. We undervalue ourselves. Her notion was these institutions are valuable and let me demonstrate their value and I'm going to demonstrate their value with data. And so that, and that, that sold. That sold a lot better uh, than the social implications. Uh, so had, that, you, had you seen anybody do that before? I had not. I had not. We had not. Uh, and so matter of fact, we uh, brought in researchers from Atlanta and other places who had done these kind of economic analysis. And so uh, we did it for the University of the HBCUs in North Carolina. Uh, and we also uh, were going to do it for some of those in South Carolina. Andrea was a very courageous woman, uh, human being. Uh, she also um, demonstrated don't allow anyone to put any limitations uh, on you based on sex or race or uh, 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 financial wherewithal. Uh, she did that for women, but she absolutely did that for all of us. So if, if women can look at her life and recognize the courage that she had to step into any situation like she belonged, one of her major sayings was, if you're in the room, act like you're supposed to be in the room. I was inspired to see um, a black lady, um, an intelligent warrior, and a fierce advocate for what was right. Um, most importantly, I was inspired to see the impact that she could have on just about any situation uh, and any person have a positive impact. Um, she was a, a humanitarian. Um, who really stood and spoke up for the rights of those who many times may have felt that they were voiceless or some may have thought were voiceless. Um, I can recall um, even during this administration when I heard about uh, Ms. Harris going over to the legislature and shaking things up. And that when I heard that, I was so excited. Um, it was inspiring to me and um, I was like, yes, that's the Andrea Harris that we all know and love. There is no question um, that there is an entire generation of African-American women in North Carolina who owe their sanity to Andrea Harris. She saw the trails we were blazing and was always there to talk through strategy, to, um, as I said, keep us accountable. There are times when Andrea would call me and before she said hello, she's like, Anita Brown Graham, what the hell are you doing over there? <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm in trouble. But that raw authenticity that she brought to our relationships created a safe space that allowed us to just be who we needed to be in the moment with her. It's not just that that's rare, it's unique. I did not know that my Bennett sister and my Sora was ill. I never knew of an illness because it hadn't been six months. I think it was that she was here in Charlotte looking her finest. She was over at South Charlotte. I went over there to a conference they was having and, and uh, no signs at all that there was an illness. So I get a text the day before she passed that says we're gonna do um, a prayer call. And so we we were asked to be on the line on at 11.30. And I looked at the message and it went out to 10 people. We all responded, 11.30 works for us. Um, the next day, and this was probably middle of the day, and the next day we all look forward to getting on this call. And I talked with Bridget Wall who set up the call and even um, 
Tammy Hall, and we talked about it was time to pray for Mama. Mm. So we get on the call and we start he hearing bips. You know, every time someone gets online, you hear a little bleep. Mm -hmm. You know, hey everybody, and some spoke, spoke, some didn't. But Steve, we're talking about a text that went to 10 people. At 11.30, we had 152 people on the line. Now, I don't know that. We don't know that, but I'm saying Ms. Harris had such an impact. Anybody that knew the words of prayer, that knew God for themselves, wanted to be a part of that call. With me, she just was saying, I just am tired. I want to be with my brother and my mama. And I was like, well, what about us? Amara, I love y'all to death. I just, I'm tired. I'm so tired, you know? And I just didn't understand what she meant by, you know, she's so tired other than the fact that she had been by herself in these facilities for so long. And at that point, she had also had a stroke. And she said, I just can't stand this pain. Now I knew that uh, prior to that last um, time that she went into the hospital, that when she was in uh, rehab from her first hospital visit, that she broke her shoulder. So she was still in pain from that. And she w even when she went home, she was still nursing that shoulder and it was very painful. So I said to her, Andrea, you a fighter. Wait, you know, I, by that point, I really caught on. But she sounded very clear to me. You know, she didn't sound like somebody who was dying. Um, and I said, but she did sound like someone who uh, had really kind of given up. Really, to tell you the truth, it just was surreal. It really was surreal. Um, very, because my wife was on the phone too, but she was in a separate room from my and I could hear her holler out. Uh, and I, uh, myself, uh, certainly broke down uh, in tears. Um, and you could hear the voices of others on the phone. I can say it was surreal. It was just, man, it was uh, it's something that I never had experienced before and hope not to have to experience again. When Bridget sent out the call for the prayer meeting, I said, okay, I'll be on it. But I had committee meetings in Raleigh, so I got on late as uh, Reverend Barber was praying and all, and the call came in. So it was right at that moment in terms of the call, the screaming and all of that. And I said, whoa, what happened? Uh, and then uh, someone said, well, you missed he was praying, but you missed the announcement. And I said, what announcement? And they told me. <sighs> so it was like that. To be honest, I still can't really, it's hard to talk about her in the past because I just feel like she's just so present. And, um, you know, it was a tough year. I'm not. I'm not CC without Ms. Harris. Um, I'm not the businessman. I am without Ms. Harris. I remember when Andrea passed, I was dealing with her death and people were calling me saying, you know, she left this legacy in your hands. And there was a lot of pressure I felt that it's not enough to maintain where we are. It must grow and it must become more influential because people are dependent on us. So I would turn to those who listen to this message and who come to know who the Institute is that they have a responsibility, as do I and the staff, to be a part of helping us grow and helping us identify resources so that we can grow and help those who need us most. Andrea Harris 
will be remembered because the work that she did, while it was very specific at the Institute and in the other spheres in which she worked, it is a part of a much larger work. Let's call it the work of making sure that we continue on the journey toward greater diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion in America, and obviously the world. Um, I just remember um, in, in Ms. Harris's um, later days before she transitioned to heaven, she reminded me, she said, people sometimes forget the H doesn't always mean Harris. It could mean Harriet. And to remind us of how tough she was, even as she was transitioning, that the spirit of freeing people to be better. And I remember one of the quotes that she told me, and it sits with me to this very day. She said, Harriet Tugman said, I could have freed more slaves if they knew they were slaves. And Ms. Harris lived that life. She kept going back to free more people and then to try to transform their minds and inspire their spirits to be better than what they were, but what they needed to be for others. I want to live a life like this. I want to be known for that. And um, I pray that I can carry that spirit on to someone else.